Okay, for this particular lesson, the learning object objectives will be to define functional groups and be able to identify functional groups in organic molecules. So as I mentioned in the uh, previous video, there are 18 million organic molecules. And if we were to look at each individual molecule by itself, it would be very difficult to understand all the possible chemical reactions that that molecule would undergo and then understand all the possible reactions the next molecule would undergo and so on and so forth. It would be too enormous to even con uh, contemplate. But what we can do is we can look at the structures of these organic molecules and these Organic molecules can then be divided based on those structures, which are called functional groups. A functional group is an atom or set of atoms that have a similar physical and chemical behavior. What that means is we can take a molecule as small as, say, ethylene, which has one double bond in it, or take the molecule oleic acid, which is C18, 18 carbons, and still has one double bond in it. And we can apply our knowledge from ethylene, which is just carbon, double bond carbon, and apply it to the oleic acid because it's gonna behave the same way because it has a double bond. So identifying the functional group is going to be extremely important because it's going to help us be able to determine the physical and chemical behavior. Now, the functional groups that you need to know can be found in table 12.1 of your textbook, or they can be found in the Quizlet on Blackboard. The very fun first functional group is that of an alkane. An alkane is a hydrocarbon that consists of carbon and hydrogen only. Being an alkane means that it's a compound that's going to consist of nothing but single bonds, and it's going to fit the general formula C sub n, H sub 2n plus 2. So for example, let's take um, two carbons. So we would have carbon 2. That means our hydrogen would be 2 times 2 plus 2, or in other words, the formula would be C2H6. And that would be the formula for our, um, would be the formula for ethane, which is the second one in line. So again, an alkane is going to be a hydrocarbon of carbon and hydrogen only. It's going to fit the general formula C subscript N, H subscript 2N plus 2. Methane. Uh, is going to be the simplest of all of them. It's going to have a single carbon and it's going to have four hydrogens bonded to it using single bonds. Ethane is going to be the next simplest. It's going to have a carbon single bond carbon. And then the carbons are going to be bonded to three hydrogen atoms in order to give that carbon its tetravalent or four bonds. Propane is going to be the next simplest. It's going to have a carbon backbone that is three carbons long. And then we're going to make up the additional bonds using carbon hydrogen single bonds. So the outer carbons will have three hydrogens attached to it, whereas that inner carbon only needs two hydrogens attached in order to obtain its four bonds. Now, one thing I would like you to note about the, um, the formula or the names here is that the it's called an alkane and its name ends in A-N-E. So the A-N-E is going to be something that you can look for at the end of a name that is a organic molecule. And if it has the ending A-N-E, that means that it's an alkane and it's going to be a carbon backbone that's going to have those carbons single bonded to hydrogens. Now, the second one in the group is an alkene. An alkene contains a carbon double bond carbon. So the simplest one is called ethene, if we use IUPAC naming, or ethylene. 
basically we have a carbon double bond carbon and then we're going to make up the additional bonds in order to make the tetravalent carbon have four bonds we're going to make it up with additional carbon single bond hydrogens so in ethylene you have a carbon double bond carbon and then you have carbon single bonded to eat two hydrogens for each carbon the second one is propene or called propylene and it's again going to have the um it's going to look very similar to propane, except one of them is going to have been, uh, one of the single bonds between the carbons is gonna be replaced with a double bond. And then we're going to need to make up the other bonds to get to four using hydrogen. So you'll have on the outer carbon that's attached to the double bond, you'll need two additional hydrogens. On the carbon in the center, that's attached to a double bond carbon and a single bond carbon. Well, it already has three, so you only need one more hydrogen in order to get to four. And then for the other carbon that is just single bonded to a carbon, it only has one bond. So in order to get four bonds, it needs three hydrogens. Now, an alkene, um, again, we can see, we can find an alkene by looking at its name. An alkene is going to end in E-N-E. -E. That's going to be its suffix. And again, the component that makes it an alkene is the C double bond C. Next, you have alkynes. Alkynes consist of a carbon triple bond carbon. Um, if we name it using, the simplest one is ethyne, using IUPAC naming, but it has another name called acetylene. And basically this is a carbon triple bond carbon. Now, again, carbon must have four bonds because it is tetravalent. So since three of the bonds are in that triple bond, it means that that car those carbons are only attached to one other hydrogen. Propine is also known as methyl acetylene, and um, it's going to have a triple bond carbon, but again, it's going to have that three carbon backbone. The carbon on the left-hand side of the triple bond is going to be single bonded to a hydrogen in order to give it four bonds. The central carbon is going to be attached to zero hydrogens because it already has four bonds. And the carbon on the right is going to have to be attached to three hydrogens in order to give it um, four bonds. Now, to recognize these, again, an alkyne, if we use IUPAC naming, is going to end in Y and E. And I'm only gonna ask you to memorize the IUPAC naming, um, but I wanted you to be aware of some of the other possible names, and that's why I've gone through them. But again, I'm only going to expect you to memorize how to do the IUPAC naming. And so if it ends in Y and E, that means it's gonna to have to have a carbon triple bond carbon. The next functional group is called an aromatic group. An aromatic group specifically contains this um, carbon double bond, carbon single bond, carbon double bond, carbon single bond, carbon double bond, carbon single bond ring. Now we can recognize uh, represent an aromatic carbon where we actually show the carbons or as we'll talk about later we can use a different notation called a line notation and at each of these points along the way it's a carbon so it still has that same six carbons we're just not representing we're not writing out all the carbons and then aromatic 
another way to illustrate it is that it is the hexagonal ring, but we put a circle in the center. These all represent the same thing. Now, the one that I'm showing you in particular is referred to as benzene. And benzene is going to be a carbon, double bond carbon, single bond carbon, double bond carbon, single bond carbon, double bond carbon, single bond. And then we have to look at how many hydrogens would be attached. Each of these carbons has three bonds attached to it already. So each carbon only needs one more hydrogen or one hydrogen, excuse me, in order to give it its four bonds. And so this is the structure of benzene. The next functional group we'll talk about is gonna be called an alkyl halide. Um, we'll talk about the fact that these CH groups can be considered to be an alkyl substituent. You'll, that's where this methyl idea came from, propyl, um, acetyl, um, ethyl. That's where these names are coming from, is that they are uh, alkyl substituents. So that's where the alkyl from alkyl halide comes from. The, per, the halide portion comes from halogens, which if you'll recall from your previous course is uh, group 17. So it's your fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So we can have a methyl chloride. And what that means is we're going to have methane essentially. but one of the hydrogens is going to be replaced with a chlorine. We can have dichloromethane. Again, we start with the methane, but the dichloro means that there's two chlorines attached to the carbon. So, Alkyl halide, again, the alkyl just means that we're talking some form of carbon substituent. And then the halide means that we're talking about a um, halogen group. It is not uncommon to find alkyl halides in medicines. Um, so anytime you see that halogen present, if you see it uh, preceded, a lot of times we're talking an alkyl halide. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about gets into uh, functional groups that are extremely important uh, biologically. Um, and that the next one we're going to talk about is an alcohol. An alcohol functional group specifically has a C, single bond O, single bond H group. And you'll recognize an alcohol because the ending will end in OL. So methanol, ethanol, propanol, they're all forms of alcohols. So let's talk methanol. Again, we've got that methane precursor. So we're talking about a single bond or a single carbon in the structure. But because we have the ending OL attached, it means that one of the hydrogens has been replaced with an alcohol group. Ethanol, we have that ethane that we started out with, which is a two carbon um, group. But on one of the carbons, we're going to replace the hydrogen with an alcohol group. So this carbon here has only one bond, so it's going to need three hydrogens attached to it. And this carbon here has two bonds, so it needs two hydrogens attached in order to give it the four bonds that carbon always requires. Our next one is that of an ether. Um, an ether specifically is going to have the carbon, single bond oxygen, single bond carbon group. So anytime you see the word ether at the end, 
it means that you have that carbon, single bond oxygen, single bond carbon. Dimethyl ether is going to be a compound that has two methyl groups attached to the oxygen, uh, two methyl groups attached to the oxygen. So this is dimethyl ether. Diethyl ether means that you're gonna have two ethyl groups, which is two carbons. attached to the oxygen in the ether. So that is diethyl ether. A lot of times you're gonna, when you see the word, uh, so if you see the word ether, it means that it's got that C-O-C grouping. The next one we're going to talk about is an amine. And an amine is going to end with the word amine. Just like ether ended in the word ether. An amine is going to end in the word amine. And specifically, an amine is going to be a carbon single bond nitrogen. That is the... Uh, functional group. A methylamine is going to be an amine that has two hydrogens attached to the nitrogen and three hydrogens attached to the carbon. But we can also have a trimethylamine which means our nitrogen is going to be surrounded by three methyl groups. So again, the key to an amine is not the NH group that's attached, it's specifically the carbon single bond nitrogen that makes it amine. Okay, our next one is called an aldehyde. An aldehyde specifically is going to have a carbonyl functional or carbonyl group attached to a hydrogen. So this is the, what I've highlighted is the aldehyde functional group. Aldehydes, when named IUPAC, with IUPAC naming, end in AL, so ethanol and propanol. So with ethanol, it means that we are going to have a two-carbon aldehyde. So it means that there's going to be on one of those carbons a C double bond O and a hydrogen. And then on the other carbon, we're going to have three hydrogens in order to give that carbon four bonds. Propanol, you're going to have a C double bond O and a hydrogen. The central carbon's going to have two hydrogens attached. And the left-hand carbon in this case is going to have three hydrogens attached. What I want you to be, realize is that the aldehyde is always going to be on the outermost carbon. It can be drawn the way I have it with the outermost carbon being on the right-hand side, but it can also be drawn where the outermost carbon is on the left-hand side. But it's going to have to be, the C double bond O is going to have to be on the last carbon in the chain. Okay, then we get to a ketone. A ketone is going to be something that has a C triple a C single bond C double bond O single bond C. In other words, it has to have a C double bond O surrounded by two other carbon groups. Ketones end in O N E, so propanone, butanone, so they end in O N E. Um, propanone is going to be a three carbon 
Okay. Whoops. Let's get the right tool out. It's going to be a three carbon chain because that's what, pro as we'll discuss, that's what propane is. And since it's an own, again, that C double bond O has to be surrounded by two other carbons. So this is the structure from propanone. Butanone, but means that there's going to be four carbons. Again, we'll talk about this more later. But in order for it to have the own, it means that the double bond is going to have to be in, the double bond O is going to have to be on a second carbon or a third carbon. It can't be on the outer carbons. So butanone will have this structure. The next functional group is a carboxylic acid. Um, carboxylic acid specifically have a C double bond O, OH functional group on the end. Again, this will always be on the outermost carbon because it has to have that C double bond O, OH functional group. Uh, carboxylic acids are named with ic acid. You've actually worked with one before because it's the key ingredient in vinegar called acetic acid. But I'll show you propanoic acid as well. Again, they end in ic acid. Um, so acetic acid is going to be a two carbon structure with that C double bond O, OH on one of the ends. And then the other carbon in the group has to have three hydrogens attached because carbon must always have four bonds. Propanoic acid is going to be a three carbon chain. Again, one of the outside carbons has to have the o double bond O, OH group attached to it. The, outer the other outermost carbon is gonna have three hydrogens because it must have four bonds. And the second carbon in the line is going to have to have two other hydrogens because of the fact that it must have four bonds. So these are examples of carboxylic acids. The next thing we're gonna talk about is an anhydride. Uh, you will see anhydrides, but you're gonna see less of the anhydrides than you will of some of the other possibilities. Um, and an anhydride has two of the C double bond O groups. It's kind of like taking a ether, but attaching double bond O's to the carbons. And acetic anhydride means that it has two acetic groups. So basically what I have drawn here is acetic anhydride. Um, where those outermost carbons will have hydrogens attached in order to give that carbon four bonds. Um, our next category is that of an ester. An ester specifically has the C double bond O, O, C group. So it's almost similar to that acetic or that anhydride that we just looked at, except only one of the carbons has a double bond O attached. Um, esters are compounds that end in A-T-E. So like methyl acetate, ethyl acetate, those would be examples of compounds that are esters. Um, methyl acetate is going to be the C double bond O, O, where you have the three hydrogens attached to the carbon on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you're going to have what is considered to be a methyl group attached to the other oxygen. 
In ethyl acetate, you have the acetate, which is the C double bond O, C, H, three group, but you're going to have an ethyl group attached to it. Whoops, I've missed an oxygen in there. And that is ethyl acetate. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is an amide. An amide specifically is a compound that has a C double bond O in group associated with it. The names of amides typically end in amide. So that's how you're going to know what it is, is the amide piece. And so acetamide is actually the one that I have drawn, almost drawn here. I'm going to put hydrogens on the left-hand carbon. It's going to be attached to the C double bond O in group. And then there's going to be hydrogens on the nitrogen in the amide functional group. Esters and amides are extremely important functional groups with respect to biological compounds. Esters are going to be uh, associated with sugar formation and amides are going to be associated with protein formation. So you will see these types of bonds again. The next thing we're going to talk about is the thiol. The thiol specifically is an SH group. So if you'll recall, an alcohol had the OL and was attached to the carbon on the end. A thiol is an SH and is attached to the carbon. So ethyl thiol is going to be two carbons, but on one of the carbons, you're gonna have an SH group. A disulfide is going to have this um, S single bond S, functional group in the middle. And it's going to end in disulfide, just like the name has disulfide. So dimethyl disulfide will have two methyl groups attached to the sulfurs that make up the backbone. Um, a Disulfide bond is going to be important when we start talking about protein folding later on. And finally, the last one we will talk about is a sulfide, which is just going to be a sulfur surrounded by two carbons. So if we have ethyl methyl sulfide, it means that we're going to have an ethyl group. attached to a sulfur, attached to a methyl group. Now, I don't want you to panic. I know that this is a lot to take in. I am not asking you as of yet to be able to name all of these functional groups and all of the compounds with the functional group. At this point in time, all I want you to be able to do is recognize functional groups. 
be able to recognize that a C dash S dash S dash C is a disulfide. Be able to recognize that if I see a C double bond O dash uh, bond N, that is an amide. Be able to recognize that if I see a C double bond O, OH, that I'm talking about a carboxylic acid. That is what I want you to be able to recognize at this point. I also want you to be able to recognize the endings that we give these things. An amide is going to be listed as an amide for its ending. An alcohol is going to have the OL as its ending. The alkane is going to have the ending of A and E. So again, at this point, I'm not asking you to be able to name these compounds. All I'm asking you to be able to do is recognize when you have a specific functional group what that functional group is and recognize it by the subscript or I'm sorry, the suffix or the uh, ending of the name. Your first lab, which we should be doing Monday was to do a functional group scavenger hunt. Now, the functional group scavenger hunt asks you to find in various commercial products these different types of compounds. So what are you going to do? You're going to look at the labels. And in those labels, you're going to be looking for the suffixes, ain, all, owl, stuff like that. And then you're going to take and write that name that you see on that commercial product. You can then go look up the structure and on the internet and draw the structure. Now with this, I do expect you to use products that you would use, not that are something that you just find on the internet. So in other words, this means you do need to go out to the store and look at product labels. You can look at your own medications if you want and look at the label and see if you can identify the functional groups. But don't just, don't go out and find something that a geriatric person would be using if you're not geriatric. In other words, find something you would be using because that is part of this a functional group scavenger hunt is for you to realize that you use products with these particular functional groups on a rare, on a fairly regular basis. So this is an introduction to functional groups. We will actually spend a lot more time on most of these functional groups as we progress through the remainder of the semester. And as we progress through the remainder of the semester, we will learn how to name compounds that contain these functional groups. We will learn how these functional groups affect the properties of that compound. And so it's going to become a, a very important tool in our toolbox as we move forward.